Good morning. We are continuing our series. This is week five of our series on heaven and hell, where we've been answering questions regarding eternity. Uh, now, it's one thing to think about eternity, uh, about what you want it to be like, or, or to think about eternity on based uh, on what you think it will be like, or what popular culture tells us it's going to be like. But if we want to know what eternity is really going to be like, we have to look at the authoritative source right? The Word of God. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us everything there is to know about eternity. Some things are only going to be revealed when we get there. Uh, But the Bible is clear about some things regarding eternity. It's clear on things like, what happens after I die? Right? What are the new heavens and the new earth going to be like? How should the hope of heaven influence how I live today? Right? It's clear on hell and divine judgment. That's what Fritz talked about last week. And what is genuine belief? Right? And because the Bible is clear on these issues regarding eternity, what it has to say should impact how we live today, even if that challenges some of the ways that we're currently thinking or currently living. Now, that's important, so I'm going to say it again. Because the Bible is clear regarding the things about eternity, right, that should influence how we live today, even if that challenges some of the ways that we're currently thinking or some of the ways that we're currently living. You know, Mark Twain once wrote, It ain't those parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. Do you find that to be true of your own life? I find that to be true of my life too. Sometimes it's the parts of the Bible that are very clear that bother us the most. It's those things that challenge ways that we currently think or ways that we currently live. Now today, uh, the topic that that we're going to be talking about is, are there eternal rewards for believers in heaven? Are there eternal rewards for believers in heaven? You know, this series was not just designed uh, so we can get more information about what the Bible has to say regarding eternity. This series was designed so that we can get more information about what the Bible says regarding eternity and so we can align our minds and our lives with what that says. Uh, So are there eternal rewards for believers in heaven? As I was studying Uh, preparing for this message, uh, I looked at many, many, many of the verses throughout Scripture that have to do with eternal reward for believers in heaven. And as I looked at all of those passages, uh, there was one overwhelming thing that linked all of them together, one overwhelming thing that all of them had in common, and it was this. Live your life now in light of eternity, right? Let the choices that you make today reflect the fact that Jesus is coming back. There's a consistent call throughout the Bible to fix our eyes on heaven, to keep seeking the things above, to set our minds on eternal things, to be faithful to do what God has called us to do until Jesus comes back. I don't know about you, but for me, it's very easy to get distracted with the things of the world and forget about living with an eternal perspective. Right? The passage, the main passage that we're going to be looking at this morning is from Luke chapter 19. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 10 through 27. Now, we're going to be looking at several other passages as well that, that have to do with this topic of are there eternal rewards for believers in heaven? But the main passage that we're going to be working out of is Luke chapter 19, verses 10 through 27. Now, as you're turning there, uh, I want to tell you a quick story. When I was little, uh, there was a rule in our house. It was sort of a rite of passage. And it was this, when we turned eight years old, we had to start mowing the yard, right? And I remember, we had a half acre yard, uh, and I was a pretty little eight-year-old. And so I remember that mower handle was way up here, and I would have to look at the ground and push that thing. And by the time I got to the end of a row, I'd look back, and it'd be kind of like this, like this angled thing. Well, one summer day, right, Dad was getting ready to go to work, and he said, uh, hey, uh, I want you to mow the yard today. I don't care how you get it done. Uh, But when I come home tonight, I went to yard mode. And uh, now dad had provided everything we needed to mow the yard. We had a mower, he had provided gas, and we had the time. And he said, I don't care how you get it done, but when I come home, uh, I went to yard mode. And off he went to work. And you know what we did? We rode our bikes around town, right? And we gathered all the neighborhoods together and we played a baseball game. We strung up the sprinkler over the clothesline and ran through it. Any of y'all remember that? We did that every day in the summer. Right? We even climbed up the, the, the TV tower antenna, TV antenna tower of our two-story house, and we threw our G.I. Joe dolls off, not dolls, action figures, right? 
We threw our G.I. Joe action figures off the roof with these homemade parachutes we made out of paper towels and string, right? And then we even got out the lawn jarts. Remember those? And we threw some lawn jarts, right? We had a great summer day, right? Now, we didn't do anything bad. We didn't go around town, you know, stealing bikes or breaking windows or painting graffiti, right? We didn't do anything bad, but we also didn't do what dad had told us to do, right? We were so caught up in all the good things of summer that were right in front of us that I honestly forgot to mow the yard. And it was 5.30 before I knew it, right? And dad pulled in the driveway and he came walking up the walk. And I remember he came walking up and he looked at me and he looked at the yard and he looked back at me and then he went in the house. And a few minutes later, he came out. He had changed out of his work clothes and he had his t-shirt and shorts and his tennis shoes on and he went down the garage and he got the mower and he mowed the yard. And I just had this sense of sadness in my heart. Now, I didn't doubt that dad loved me, right? I knew he loved me. I wasn't afraid that he was going to kick, kick me out of the family, right? I wasn't scared of that. That wasn't the issue. But there was this ache in my heart because I hadn't done what dad had told me to do. And I missed out on hearing him say, you know what, Kelly, good job, right? That was a long time ago. And yet I still remember that today, right? Listen, just before Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and die and be buried and raise again and go to heaven, he gave, he gave his disciples some instructions about what he wants us to do while he's gone. And he told, us, he told his disciples a parable. That's what we're going to look at this morning. And he indicated in that parable uh, that when he comes back, there's going to be a reward for those who have been faithful and for those who have followed him. So let's look at our passage this morning. Matthew 19, starting in, in verse 10, this is what it says. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, while they were still listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. Now, a mina in that day was equivalent to about 100 days wages, so a little over three months of salary. He gave each one of his servants uh, a mina. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And when he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over ten cities. And the second came saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are an, ex an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, by your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Let's pray as we're getting started this morning. Gracious Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful that you haven't left us without witness. You've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open up your word to our hearts this morning. Help us see what you want us to see uh, until you return, because we know you're coming back, and we want to be faithful until then. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to be looking at three things today uh, that have to do with eternal rewards for believers in heaven, uh, and they come from this passage. And here's the first one. Jesus' work on the cross has secured an eternal reward for those who follow him. Jesus' work on the cross has secured an eternal reward for those who follow him. Look at verse 10 again. Verse 10 says this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save 
that which was lost. Jesus says this is why he came to earth, to seek and to save that which was lost. He made this statement right after he had an interaction with a man named Zacchaeus. At the beginning of chapter 19 is the story of Zacchaeus. And so for some of you who grew up in church, you might know the song of Zacchaeus, right? He was a wee little man, right? You remember that song? Uh, Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and he had been living a, a corrupt life. He would collect taxes, and then he would skim off the top of what he had collected. This was a guy who was lost, and he was caught up in his sin, and he knew it. And the Bible tells us that when he heard that Jesus was coming, he ran and he climbed a tree so that he could see Jesus, right? Now, in that day, government officials didn't run, and they certainly didn't climb trees, right? That wasn't proper. But there was nothing that was going to keep this guy from seeing Jesus. Now, we don't know how he had heard about Jesus. You know, Matthew, the disciple, was also a tax collector. So maybe because they ran in the same circles, maybe Matthew had told Zacchaeus about Jesus. We don't really know. All we know is that from this passage that that Zacchaeus laid his pride aside and there was nothing that was going to keep him from seeing Jesus. And when he met Jesus, his life was changed, right? This, the Bible the, it isn't clear in verse 19 about everything that was going on in Zacchaeus' heart, but clearly something happened because uh, when he interacted with Jesus, he said, I'm going to return everything that I've stolen from people up to four times as much. So the proof of his faith was shown in his actions and in his repentance. And then Jesus says to him, today, salvation has come to this house. And then summing up his, you know, there were a lot of people around listening to Jesus talk to Zacchaeus. And so to sum up everything that he had just told Zacchaeus, this is what he said to everybody who was standing around. That's verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So the question is this, what was lost? right? Humanity, you and me. Despite what popular culture says, you're not a happy accident of the universe, right? You are way more valuable than that. The Bible says that God created you in his image, and he created you with a purpose. And that purpose was to know God and to rely on God and enjoy being with him. That's the way it was in the beginning with Adam and Eve. They knew God and they relied on God and they enjoyed being with God. But then in an act of rebellion, they chose to disobey God and to go their own way. And when they disobeyed God's command and chose self-leadership over God's leadership, when they chose to rely on themselves instead of to rely on God, that's when sin entered the world. And as a result, that sin has spread to everyone. The Bible is replete with references that we are all sinners, that we've all chosen to go our own way, like Zacchaeus, It tells us that all of our hearts are corrupt and self-serving. That's our default position until we come to know Jesus. Do you know what it means that we're all sinners, that we've chosen to walk our own way and rely on ourselves? It means that we're deserving of the righteous wrath and judgment that God's going to execute upon his enemies when he returns. Fritz talked about this last week. The fact that everyone dies a physical death is a consequence of our sin. But a time is coming when God will pour out his wrath on his enemies and they'll be separated from him forever. That's worse than physical death. That's spiritual death, being separated from God forever, right? And if we realize that we're in this situation, what can we do? If you realize this morning that you're in that situation, what can you do, right? The reality is there's nothing you can do. But God did something. You know what he did? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He set out on a rescue mission for you. Romans 5, uh, verses 6 through 8 says this, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? Paul, in Ephesians 2, he expands on this a little bit more just to show us how corrupt we were before we knew Christ. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too 
all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Right? Paul wants us to understand that we were enemies of God and we were rightly deserving of his wrath. That is our default position. But then verse 4, what does it say? Two of the sweetest words in the Bible. But God, right, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen, we all have the same desperate need, right? All of us were dead. All of us were walking according to the course of this world. We were all blinded by Satan. We all had disobedient spirits. We were all indulging the lusts of our flesh and of our minds. And we were all rightfully deserving of God's wrath and judgment. But that's why God sent Jesus. So he could take God's wrath and the punishment that we deserved so that we could be restored to to a relationship with him forever. Peter Peter makes it very clear in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He says this, And he himself, talking about Jesus, And he himself bore our sins in his body. He bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Right? I'll say it again. There was nothing that we could do to earn our way back to God on our own, so Jesus did it for us. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, you and me. Titus 3 uh, says this, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Jesus went to the cross to take away your sin and mine. And Titus 3 tells us it's so that we could be justified before God. Now, justified is a legal term. And what justified means is you're declared righteous. God declares you not guilty. When Jesus went to the cross, he took away your sin and you get his righteousness. Right? That's what justification means. uh, God poured out his wrath on Jesus. And justified means he declared Jesus guilty in your place. So now you you have a legally right standing before God. You are no longer guilty. Listen, God could have left it at that, right? He could have sent Jesus out on a rescue mission. Jesus died on the cross, raised from the dead, so that you could have a right standing before God and be declared not guilty. That would be amazing. And God could have left it right there at that. But he didn't leave it there. He did more than that. In John uh, chapter 1, verse 12, it says that to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. When you trust in Jesus' death and resurrection as the only way to be made right with God, you not only receive that verdict of not guilty, you not only receive a right standing before God, he also adopts you. He makes you his child, right? And he says, you're now an heir of all that I've prepared for those who love me. You're in his family, right? You don't ever have to be afraid of getting kicked out of God's family. You don't ever have to wonder if God loves you, right? He loves you. You're in his family. Nothing. Once you place your faith in Jesus, nothing can ever change that. What a gift, right? Unearned and undeserved and lavishly given. Jesus' work on the cross has secured the eternal reward of being with him in heaven forever for everybody who puts their faith in him. That's good news, right? What a reward, right? There are places in the Bible, some of you might have heard about crowns as a reward in the Bible. There are places in the Bible that talks about receiving the crown of life or receiving the crown of righteousness or the crown of glory or the incorruptible crown, right? All of those passages are pointing to the same thing. God has given us New life in Jesus, the crown of life, right? Jesus took our sin, we get his righteousness, the crown of righteousness. Jesus prayed that the glory that God had given him, that he would give it to us so that we could be together with him. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we get the reward 
of eternal life with him. God is our eternal reward. Amen? 1 Peter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and it will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the, in the last time. Listen, that is such good news. Jesus' work on the cross has secured an eternal reward for all who trust in him. So here's the question. He's adopted us into his family. He's given us a right standing before him. He's prepared an inheritance for us that's never going to fade away, right? So what do we do now until Jesus comes back? Do we just sit around and say, thank you, God. I cannot wait for my inheritance, right? No, that's not what we're supposed to do. And that brings us to our second point. The second point is this. We're not saved to a passive faith. We're saved to an active faith right? God did not save us to a passive faith. God saved us to an active faith. After Jesus got done talking with Zacchaeus, uh, right after that interaction with Zacchaeus, Jesus told his followers this parable because they were, mis- they were mistaken. They thought Jesus was going to establish his kingdom right then, but Jesus wanted to correct their misunderstanding. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to establish my eternal kingdom right now. I got to go away and receive that kingdom from my father, but while I'm gone, right, I'm going to give you some work to do. And so in the parable, Jesus gave each of the servants a mina. Everybody was entrusted with the same thing. And he told them to do business with that until he came back. They were supposed to put their mina to work. They weren't just supposed to sit around and wait for Jesus to return. Right? Two of the servants were faithful in putting the mina to work, and they got rewarded. They did what the king had told them to do. The other one did nothing with the mina that was entrusted to him. He just wrapped it up in a handkerchief and hid it. The minas in the parable represent a gospel, the gospel stewardship that God has, that every follower of Jesus has been given. Everybody got the same thing, right? It's not talking about money. It's not talking about talents because some of us have more talents or abilities than others. I'm at the low end of that, right? Some of us have more money, than others. But that's not what this is talking about. Everybody got the same thing. So what's the same thing that God gives to every believer? He entrusts us with this gospel stewardship until he comes back. Just before Jesus went to heaven, he gave his followers some instructions. Do you remember the Great Commission? Jesus, what did Jesus say in the Great Commission? Go and do what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? And teach them to obey everything that I've taught you. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 20, just as God sent me, so I'm sending you. Right? We can use his, his interaction with Zacchaeus as a model. Just like what I did with Zacchaeus, that's what you're to be about while I'm gone. Right? He said in Mark, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. All of his servants were given the same task. They were all to be about the work of the kingdom until he returned. And like I said, Jesus gives us a model of what being about the work of the kingdom can look like in his interaction with Zacchaeus. So what could being about the work of the kingdom look like? Well, it could look like seeking out people who are lost. That's what Jesus did. The word says that Jesus went and sought out Zacchaeus. It could look like that. It could look like inviting someone over to your house for a meal. Or in the case of Jesus, inviting yourself over to someone else's house for a meal, right? You have permission. The Bible, Jesus did it, right? Invite yourself over to someone's house uh, for a meal. Uh, It could look like noticing someone and engaging them in a spiritual conversation, right? It could look like noticing someone at work that looks like they're, they're thinking about something or maybe they're going through something tough. Notice them and engage them in a spiritual conversation. That's what Jesus did with Zacchaeus, right? It could look like leading a group of people to help them understand more about God and his kingdom. That's what Jesus did. After he got done talking with Zacchaeus, he turned to everybody who was there, and he said, this is why I came. So it could look like any of those things. But we see Jesus doing all of these things in his interaction with Zacchaeus, and Jesus tells us, hey, 
you're to be about the same things until I return. Right? The fact that Jesus is gone makes it very easy for us to get distracted, right? to wrap what we've been entrusted with up in a handkerchief and to focus on the things of this earth. Right? Comfort, prestige, power, wealth. But Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, he keeps drawing our eyes to eternity. This is what he says. Do not store up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but rather store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus wants us to keep fixing our eyes on heaven, to keep seeking the things above, to set our minds on eternal things, and to be faithful to do what God has called us to do until Jesus returns. I don't know about you, but that's not easy for me, right? It's so easy for me to get distracted. But we're supposed to be about the work of the kingdom in a world that's hostile to God, among a people who don't want Jesus to be their king. Remember verse 14 in our parable? All the rest of the people said, we don't want that guy to be our king. And then he called his servants to him and said, hey, go do business with this, right? That's our model. There's a whole world of people out there that don't want Jesus to be their king. And yet, God tells us, hey, I've entrusted you with the gospel. Go among these hostile people who don't want me and share it with them, right? Matthew 5, in Matthew 5, starting in verse 11, Jesus told his disciples this, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then he says this, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right? Jesus wants us to know that even in the midst of a hostile world, there's a reward waiting for those uh, who are faithful to do what he's told them to do. Keep fixing your eyes on that eternal reward of getting to spend forever with Jesus. What this parable and what the other scriptures tell us is that when Jesus comes back, we're going to have to give an account to him of how we've uh, spent what's been entrusted to us. How did we spend our time? Right? Did we redeem the time? The Bible tells us to redeem the time. Right? Did we spend all of our time playing lawn yards or running through the sprinkler? Right? Did we redeem the time or did we waste the time? Listen, it's not just about not doing bad things. Right? Jesus didn't save you only so that you wouldn't sin. Right? He wants you to do more than that. It's about being about the work of the kingdom that Jesus has given us to do so that we can please him. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the Bible's clear that those who follow Jesus are secure in him, right? God has separated our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. God, it says in the Bible that God will remember our sin no more and that that our salvation is a free gift from God that we cannot earn. Romans 8 is crystal clear that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what what 2 Corinthians 5 is not talking about This judgment seat of Christ is not talking about being judged for our sin. Jesus has already taken that away, right? Our eternal destiny is not hanging in the balance. Listen, if you've placed your faith in Jesus' death and resurrection as the the only basis of your salvation, you are secure in Christ. You don't have to wonder if God loves you. He loves you. You don't have to worry if he's going to kick you out of the family, right? He's not. He adopted you as his child, remember? You're part of his family. Your inheritance is secure. It's reserved for you in heaven. That's not the issue. We don't have to be afraid of that. But what we do want to do is live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God. Because one day when he comes back, we're going to have to give an account to him to how, how, what, what have we done with what he's entrusted to us. So what this judgment seat in 2 Corinthians 5, what it appears to be is a judgment for believers for how we've lived, lived our lives. 
Since we know that there's not going to be any more tears in heaven, maybe this is a judgment that will bring great joy to those who have built something of eternal value on the foundation that Jesus has laid. You know, in the Greek, this word for bad, in the original language that the Bible was written, this word for bad in verse 10, that it says, you'll, they, they're going to have to give an account uh, for what they've done, whether good or bad. This Greek word for bad isn't the normal word that's used for bad when it refers to a moral good or bad. That's not what Paul's talking about here. This word for bad that Paul uses means worthless or useless or of no account. So what Paul is saying here is, hey, for believers, when Jesus comes back and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to have to give an account for those good things that you did, but also for those worthless things you did. It's not about sin, but how did you spend your time? Were you faithful to do what he's called you to do? Paul has given us another reminder to keep focusing on eternal things, to be about the work of the kingdom until Jesus returns, to build on the foundation of the gospel of grace that Jesus has laid. And the Bible says that for those who do that, they're going to receive a reward, right? Some of us might be involved in sowing the seed of the gospel, right? Being the first person that gets to tell someone about Christ. Some of us might be involved in watering that seed, encouraging people uh, to know Christ, asking spiritual questions, answering spiritual questions that they might have. That might be some of our role. Some of us might get to be the ones that, uh, that get to see the harvest, right? We might be the one that gets to pray with that person and sees them cross the line of faith. But listen, whatever your part is, Jesus says, put your mina to work, right? He's coming back, and you weren't saved to a passive faith. God saved you to an active faith. So be about the work of the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 3 says this, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Right? Back to 2 Corinthians 5. What does Paul say should be our motivation for, for being about the work of the kingdom? Should our motivation be these rewards that we're going to receive? No. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, that our motivation is to please God. Right? You see, you can be about the work of the kingdom, but you can be about it for the wrong reasons right? You, you can do it to earn the praise of men, right? You can be about the work of the kingdom to make yourself feel good. Or you can be about the work of the kingdom and you can do it in sort of a competitive manner, right? Trying to outdo everybody else to see who can earn the best reward. Jesus' Jesus's disciples were even prone to this, remember? Right before Jesus went to the cross, they came to him and said, hey, Jesus, uh, when your kingdom comes back, let one of us sit on your right hand and let the other one of us sit on your, on your left hand, Right? They had the wrong motivation, right? They were focused on the reward, right? But, but Paul says the motivation should be to please God, right? We must constantly check our motivation when we're seeking to do kingdom work because until the Holy Spirit's work of transformation is complete in our hearts, until our transformation into the image of Christ is complete, we're going to struggle with wrong motivations and competing desires, right? That's, that's just the reality, but incidentally, might we not consider that that's also going to be another reward in heaven? Right? Because when we get to heaven, our transformation will be complete. Paul tells us in the Bible, right, that he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. So when Jesus comes back and, and we get to go to heaven, we're not going to have to struggle anymore with wrong desires or wrong motivations in our heart. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. I get to worship Jesus from a pure heart right? There's not going to be any more of that, uh, that, that struggling with wrong motivation. 
That's an amazing reward. This isn't a competition to see who can get more rewards in heaven. Listen, I want to hear Jesus say to me on that day, well done, Kelly, right? Good job. Enter into the joy of heaven. I want that, and I want that for you too, right? It's not a competition. We want everybody. We should want that for for everybody. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 23, says this, "Let let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Listen, Jesus is coming back. So let's help one another not get distracted by the things of this earth, but let's keep encouraging one another to be about the work of the kingdom until Jesus returns. And incidentally, you know what's a great way to do that? Join a small group, right? If you're in a small group, you're with other believers, and you get to look at the word together and see what Jesus has to say, right? You get to encourage one another to keep, keep pressing on, even though it's hard. You get to pray for each other. What, a, what, a, what better way is there than to keep your mind focused on heaven than to do it with other believers? There's going to be a new semester of small groups starting up in a few weeks, so be watching for that. If you've never been part of one, I, mean, I would encourage you to, to join a small group. Listen, that brings us to our last point, and the last point is this. The choices that we make today impact eternity. The choices that we make today impact eternity. Back back to the parable, uh, verses 14 and then 26 and 27. This is what verse 14 says. But his citizens hated him, and they sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And then skipping down to verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Listen, what what our passage from this morning teaches us is that there are two judgments when Jesus returns. One is a judgment for believers. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And that's when they'll be given the reward of being together forever with Jesus in heaven. Where those who have faithfully engaged in the work of the kingdom, in the power of the Holy Spirit, will hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Right? But there's another judgment. And that judgment is called the great white throne judgment. And this is what Fritz talked about last week. That's for unbelievers. That judgment is for people who have never said yes to Jesus as their forgiver and leader. It's for those people who do not want Jesus to be their king. These are the people from verse 14 that said, we don't want that guy to be our king. At that judgment, those people will be judged not on the basis of the righteousness of Christ. They're going to have to stand before God in their own sin because Christ has never taken that away. They're, they're going to be judged on that and on the fact that they continue to rebel against God. Listen, I have a question for you. Where are you today? Where are you today? Where is your heart? It's important because the choices that you make today impact eternity. Listen, for believers, we're going to have to give an account to God of how we've used what he's entrusted to us. Listen, when I was little and dad told me to mow the yard, He provided everything we needed to mow the yard. We had a mower, we had gas, and we had time. If you're a believer, God has given you everything you need to be about the work of the kingdom. He's given you his Holy Spirit to live inside of you, right? He's given you other believers to encourage you. He's given you the gospel message that goes out and changes people's hearts, right? It's not your job to, to change someone's heart. You just preach the gospel, let the Holy, put them in the hands of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's job. He's given us all of that, and he's given us time. So let's be about the work of the kingdom until Jesus returns. Because listen, it's going to be 530 before we know it, right? Jesus is coming back. Now listen, for, that's for believers. For non-believers, I'm going to talk to you for a second. For non-believers, this is your default position, even though you might not recognize it. I didn't recognize it until someone told me. For non-believers, you are currently lost in your sin. 
and under God's wrath. But it doesn't have to stay that way, right? You can, you can by faith, become part of God's family. And you can do that right here today, right? It's not some magic formula. You don't have to come to church for 10 years and, and go through a class. It, you don't have to do that. You can become part of God's family right here this morning. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is recognize that you're a sinner and under God's wrath. And all you have to do is say, man, I realize there is nothing I can do to earn my way back to God, but Jesus did that for me. And then all you have to do is put your faith in what Jesus did uh, on the cross and through his resurrection. And then you're part of the family of God. So I'm gonna ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And I'm gonna give you that opportunity right now. Listen, if you've never said yes to Jesus as your forgiver and leader, you can do that right here this morning. What matters is not the words, but what matters is your heart attitude. So I'm gonna say some words, and if you'd like to join in with those words, feel free, but it's not those words that's gonna save you. It's, it's the fact that the Holy Spirit's been working on your heart, and God is drawing you to himself. All you have to do is this. God, I recognize I'm a sinner. I realize there is nothing that I can do to earn my way back to you. But I want to trust in Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross as the only basis of my salvation. I want to say yes to you today, and I want to say yes to you every day from now on. In Jesus' name, amen.